namely the second person of the Trinity. It's interesting how frequently the New Testament speaks of the Lord Jesus Christ, the second person of the Godhead, as being the specific agent of creation. We're told that in John chapter 1 and Hebrews 1 and Colossians 1. Or when we talk about creation, we could talk about how the Creator made all of this matter. The repeated biblical assertion that God made everything ex nihilo out of nothing. And that that is a a profound uh, assertion that we are to believe and understand by faith, according to Hebrews 11. Or we could talk about the oft-repeated assertion that everything that was made was made in six successive 24-hour days. Or, you're seeing how rich and deep the doctrine of creation is, we could talk about the original goodness of all things. Seven times in Genesis 1, God said it was good, concluding with it was very good. Or we could talk about the interrelatedness of all things in creation. Before the fall, one of the things that we, we uh, don't miss enough and long for enough, before the fall, there was absolute harmony. Harmony between God and man, between man and animals. Remember, the animals would walk up to Adam to be named, and there was no fear on either part. Uh, There was absolute harmony between man and the weather and circumstances, man and nature, and this harmony will not be restored until the second advent of Christ and the consummation of all things. But while all these foundational elements in a biblical doctrine of creation are important, I want us to think about one other issue related to creation deeply for the next few Sunday mornings. Now, I tell you, I always do this with a lot of trepidation. We have a name for this at our house. My son, who's also a PCA minister, we we quiz one another using this language. This today is called the trifecta, when you get to hear from me in morning worship, Sunday school, and evening worship. And and I'm convinced that really kind of... um, Two is about the, the right limit. So uh, anybody who perseveres through three times of hearing me speak, usually when I speak on three times, by about midway through the evening sermon, I'm tired of hearing me talk. So I'll understand if you start kind of looking at your watch. But what I want us to do for the next few Sundays, beginning today, for our J term, is I want us to think about one other important aspect of our doctrine of creation, and that is the issue of creation ordinances. And the point being that there are several truths and doctrines that were woven into the fabric of the created order from the very beginning, and any society which ignores them or tries to change them does so at their own peril. And there are all kinds of historical examples of of nations, peoples, tribes who, who just throw these creation ordinances away and the society implodes. A great example of that is France during the French Revolution. France decided that under the the revolution that they wanted to do away with the Sabbath, and so they wanted to change the pattern of of time, measuring time from seven days to ten days with no Sabbath. Well, the, the nation basically blew apart during that time. So when I talk about creation ordinances, let me introduce what I mean. Look at your Bibles at Genesis 1 and 2. And yes, you will need your Bible. And I want to introduce these creation ordinances. And you will notice all of these are given before the fall. And that's huge that these are given before the fall. So when you think about them, and you think all these are a product of the fall. Well, no, cats are a product of the fall. But <laughs> these things are, are uh, there were golden retrievers in the garden before the fall. <clears throat> but all of these things are creation ordinances, and they, they predate the fall, and they are to be a part of the fabric of God's created order. So look, for example, at the first one of these. And this, I'm not taking them in, uh, in the order that Scripture brings them. We're told, for example, in Genesis 2.15, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. God gave man work to do. And he gave every single person who's an image bearer a desire for meaningful activity not leisure. Now, 
let me tell you, there's probably going to be a line after this is over of people wanting to come up to either argue with me or poke me in the nose because you are so devoted to your leisure. And what I hope to do this morning is maybe to just trim the edges off of your view of leisure and to see what the rhythm that God set in motion at creation was. It was six days of labor and one day of, of rest. Well, the, the point that we're going to see with labor is man will feel purposeless until he is fulfilling and performing what his creator made him to do. After the fall, the mandate is renewed. Look at Exodus chapter 20 with me. The mandate to work. And we talk an awful lot about the fourth commandment, the Sabbath, and we should because it's the only commandment that begins with the word remember, demonstrating that we are so prone to forget. But notice what the commandment contains. The first part of the fourth commandment in Exodus 20 verse 9 is, is an imperative to work. We're told six days you shall labor and do all your work. The commandment to rest doesn't begin till verse 10. And so notice something very important. The pattern of work is given to man in the garden as a creation ordinance. But then after the fall, the mandate to work once again is renewed here in the fourth commandment. And then the New Testament, as we'll see, reaffirms the value and the necessity of labor. This is a, a creation ordinance. God has woven work into the, into the fiber of his world. A second creation ordinance See it there in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24 and 25. You see marriage. And it is reaffirmed by Jesus in Matthew chapter 19. Once again, it's given before the fall. Then Jesus reaffirms it after the fall in Matthew 19. Marriage is the first institution before the church and the civil government. It has profound value because it's God's ordained picture of union with Christ. Marriage is even the picture in Revelation 19, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Marriage is even the picture of the consummation of all things. And no wonder we are told then in Hebrews 13 verse 4 that marriage is to be held in high honor by all. A third creation ordinance is the Sabbath. I've already mentioned it. Notice how it's given to us in Genesis 2, verses 2 and 3. We read, on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. The, this one day in seven given to us to rest is, is, first of all, modeled by what God does. He rests on the seventh day. And then a fourth creation ordinance is procreation. Look at the mandate given to be fruitful and multiply. Look at Genesis 1, 28. Then God blessed them, that is Adam and Eve. God blessed them and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. And so for those of you who have just walked in here and you think, My, these people have a lot of children. Yes, and we want more. We want a lot more. In fact, I started threatening the prayer meeting on Wednesday night. We almost don't have any pregnant women after about another month. And so I'm going to have to be forced to preach a series on covenant theology with y'all. <clears throat> but we, we rejoice in multiplication. Why? Because that's the, the mandate that God set in order in, in the creation. And one of the things, by the way, that's frightening is to look at how many countries, for example, in Western Europe, have a negative birth rate. They're not multiplying. They're not growing. And to see the societal consequences for them. And we see this issue of multiplication being fruitful and multiplying. Once again, it's restated after the fall in Genesis 9 and 1 Timothy 5. And one of the reasons, for example, why homosexuality is to be viewed as morally aberrant is it cannot fulfill God's intentions for his creation. That all species are to be fruitful and multiply, even the animals we see in Genesis 1.22. Now there's a, a fifth creation mandate, and we're not going to touch it during these next few weeks, but we'll be referring to it over and over again, and that is the, the dominion mandate. You see it there in Genesis 1.28. Instead of being subject to the creation, man is to take dominion, over the created order. God has designed a three-tiered world. God ruling over man, 
man taking dominion over creation. Notice in Genesis 2.15, man's first task was to tend and keep the garden and then show his authority over the animals in Genesis 2, verse 19 and 20, by naming them. And since man is in the image of God, he has capacity to rule and oversee. Therefore, God has charged him to do so. And so you need to recognize that the wetlands and the whales and the snail darters and spotted owls were not created in the image of God, and so they don't have the capacity for dominion. Man is to dominate creation for the glory of God. What I want to focus on this morning is the, that first proposition. When we think of these creation ordinances, things that God set in motion in the very creating of his world, his order, that any society, any nation, any tribe, any group of people who doesn't value and practice labor, Sabbath, marriage, procreation is going to be profoundly problematic and will probably just implode on itself. And there are all kinds of examples from history. I want to begin with the issue of work. And notice there in Genesis 2.15, the creation mandate, that God put Adam in the garden to work. There was an essay recently in Time magazine entitled, Europeans Just Want to Have Fun. And the author makes the point that what is wrong with America, this is a European is that we work too hard, and we need to learn from the French and other European countries where it's illegal to work more than 35 hours per week, and where six weeks of annual vacation is the minimum standard. And now the European Union has been at it again. They are now aggressively promoting a new work model. Employees are expected to follow the 180-100 model, 100% of the pay, for 80% of the time. And this is being phased in right now as we speak in Wales, Scotland, and Belgium with other countries soon to follow. And this worldview, let me just go ahead and say this will be another one of the reasons why you'll want to line up and poke me in the nose after. This worldview is distinctly unscriptural. Americans, let me just address the issue of Americans working so much harder. We may work a tiny bit harder than the Europeans, but we also work harder at our leisure which is a whole other discussion for another time. But what is wrong with this concept that I just stated, and what is the biblical worldview on labor? Let me, if you've never thought through this issue of your work, your husband's work, your wife's work, your children's work, first of all, let me point out that in a normal, healthy person's life, that you will work a minimum of 2,000 hours a year. 2,000 hours. And that means over your adult life, you'll probably work pushing up against 100,000 hours. It's worth giving half an hour to studying this. In fact, let me point out a few things you ought to, to look at. You'll notice my copy is completely falling apart of John Murray's Principles of, of Conduct. John Murray has the best discussion of the creation ordinance of labor in a couple of chapters in here. It's a brilliant discussion. If you want something shorter and less taxing, Paul Helm's book called The Callings, Gospel in This World, or an even simpler, Paul or Gene Veith, he's a Lutheran, but don't hold that against him. It's called God at Work, Your Christian Vocation in All of Life. It's worth spending a few hours and a little bit of study to try to get a handle on this. So let me set forth for you the parameters of a Christian worldview on your work. Or maybe let's ask it this way. What is your work worth? So a few, first of all, begin with a few propositions about what we mean by the creation ordinance of work. The first is something that you may disagree with right off the bat. Work is good. Work is not a product of the fall. And that's why it's so important for us to see here in Genesis 2 that God gives the mandate to Adam to work before the fall. It's a creation ordinance along with marriage and Sabbath, and therefore it's binding on all creatures everywhere. Everyone should work. The desire to be one of the idle rich is an ungodly desire. If you see the idle rich and you envy them and covet their lifestyle, that is an unholy desire. The sovereign Lord's holy intention is for you to work. Laziness is wicked because God made you to work, and when you don't, you're not living for the purposes for which you were created. 
Laziness is wicked because he robs God of the glory you might have given him through diligent labor. Laziness is wicked because it robs others. Instead of doing good to them, you're forced to take from them. That's why Paul stated this. Look at your Bible at 2 Thessalonians and be astounded what high esteem the New Testament holds work in. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. And I want you to notice what Paul says to do if you are friends with, if you're in a church with, a man who's lazy. One of my dear friends talks about another man that we know, and he says, he's the type to look for work, he's just not the type to find it. Well, notice what Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 3, beginning in verse 6. This is a New Testament mandate. Paul says, we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw. That means relationally cut yourself off from every brother. This is a confessing believer who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition you see from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow us. We were not disorderly among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but we worked with labor and toil night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you, not because we don't have authority, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. For when we were with you, we commanded you this, If anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. But we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner. Do you know what the definition of disorderly is? It's in the next clause. Look. Not working at all, but are busybodies. Now those who are such we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. And so the point is that Paul is making is is everyone should work and anybody who claims to be a believer and isn't working, pull back from them. He says to withdraw. He says this person is so disorderly it will infect you if you hang out with them. Well, Repeatedly, for example, in Proverbs, especially in Proverbs 18 and 19, we are told by the writer of Proverbs that that working hard is wise, it's good, and it's noble. In fact, what we are told in Proverbs is not to be moderate about our work. Cotton Mather, one of the last of the Puritans and one of the great early American heroes, pastor in Boston, emphasized this with his famous maxim, they that will not sweat on earth will sweat in hell. Work is good. How do we know that? Jesus worked. Listen to this premise. I don't know if you've ever considered this. Our Lord Jesus spent more of his adult life working as a carpenter than he did in his public ministry. This sends a a significant message about the dignity of hard work. And then God promises profound blessings to the hard worker included in them are restfulness. According to Ecclesiastes 5, The writer of Ecclesiastes says, the sleep of the laboring man is sweet. But that's just the first premise of our biblical worldview. Work is good. Second is, work has dignity. Why? Because God works. We're told in Genesis 1 verse 31, God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. God's a worker. And then again in Genesis 2 verse 3, God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because he rested from all his work. Since we are made in his image, we have the Imago Dei. We too are made for work. You will be unsatisfied and restless and unfulfilled and have no sense of dignity and purpose if you're not engaged in consistent meaning labor. Some of you, I I of course wouldn't point you out by name, maybe just by this, Some of you, your children have been home long enough this summer from school that they have actually come to you and said these horrible words. I am bored. There is one biblical answer for that. It's not entertainment. It's work. God has made you so that you, whether you're seven years old or 57, you will be restless and unsatisfied if you're not laboring. God has made us to work, and it has dignity because our God is a worker. A third plank in our biblical worldview on labor is work discloses your character. 
What God made reveals His nature and His character. Listen to what's said about what God made in the garden before the fall. It was good. Over and over again, six times until finally the seventh time, it was very good. And since you are made in the image of God, your work reveals your character. What you do in your labor, in your vocation, reveals who you really are. And so I would ask you, what does the quality and the quantity of your work reveal about your sanctification? We're given several New Testament mandates for our work. For example, we're told to labor in Colossians 3.17, in the name of Christ. Does your work show that? That you labor in the name of Christ. We're told in Colossians 3.23, to do our work heartily. I love the UPS man. He comes to our office a few times a week, and by the time he gets to us, he's sweating, especially in July. And he's not griping, he's smiling. And especially one of our UPS guys has moved here last year from Boston. And ever so often, he's really sweating. And I said, how are you handling the heat? He says, I love being in South Carolina as he drops his package and sprints back to his truck. And I thought, this is a guy who's a picture of Colossians 3.23. He, he does his work heartily. And so I would ask, what is your work disclosing about your character? Do you give 40 hours work for 40 hours pay? If Christ found you at your job, would he say to you, well done, good and faithful servant? In Colossians 3, we are told to do our labor for the master, not for man service, for eye service. Well, a fourth premise in terms of our work. And I'm setting up here as a creation ordinance a biblical worldview on labor, on work. A fourth premise. Your work is to dominate the last six days of the week. While rest and worship are to fill the day, the first day, that means today you have nothing else to do but rest and worship and fellowship. You have nothing else to do. That's to, to fill the first day. But notice... Go back to Exodus chapter 20 and notice what we're told there in the fourth commandment. Notice what's to fill the rest of your week. Exodus chapter 20, verse 9, you're given this imperative. And it's always fascinating to me when you see the Ten Commandments posted in government buildings or in front of churches or that people always omit this that what they'll do is they'll shorthand it. They'll just say, fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. I'm thinking, hey, we're whole Bible Christians here. We're full gospelers. So come on, put the whole commandment up there. Look at the front end of the fourth commandment in Exodus 20, verse 9. The first part of the fourth commandment is an imperative to be laboring on those six days. The biblical rhythm of life. Now, let me just go ahead and... Now, make the last person mad who's not mad at me yet. The biblical rhythm of life is not five days and 40 hours on the job, then comes two days of my time. That is not the biblical rhythm of life. That's a product of the labor union movement and the contemporary fixation with leisure time. The scripture has a different rhythm of life, and you see it right there in Exodus 20. Stare at that. This is, to, this is what is to set your clock every week. The biblical rhythm of life is six days labor. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean on a job for, for pay. That could be laboring on your home or laboring for others. And so, by the way, I think it's easier in this culture to be a Sabbatarian than any other culture in history. Because before, most people, I, I think of my granddad, who he needed to labor on his farm, and he could barely eke out a living six days. But most of you can labor five days. Some of you labor four, four and a half days. Kind of got that European thing going. And you can do that and still have a whole day left over to cut your grass and work on your car and run the vacuum and all that kind of stuff. So the biblical rhythm of labor is six days for on a paying job or for myself and one day of rest and worship. Well, I would ask you which rhythm characterizes your life today. Are you a five and two person or are you a six and one? The famous evangelist Sam Jones, who died in 1906, used to have what he called quitting meetings for new converts. People would come and publicly confess their sins and repent of them. 
And Sam Jones encouraged people to swear off everything from drunkenness and profanity to immorality and gossiping. And so one night at his quitting meeting, he saw this woman who was in line, and she looked very respectable. He thought, I wonder what in the world this woman has to quit. And she walked up, and Sam Jones said, what is it that you're going to quit? She said, I ain't been doing nothing, and I'm going to quit that. <laughs> so I want to think about the history of this discussion. Pre-Reformation. Prior to 1520, all labor was divided into sacred and secular. The only people who had, whose labor had value were the Roman Catholic priests. The Protestant Reformation shattered that wall between sacred and secular, and they claimed, claimed all of life for Christ. Martin Luther, writing at the beginning of the Protestant Reformation in his commentary on Ecclesiastes 9.10, which says, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Luther wrote these words. God does not want you to succeed without work. He doesn't want you to sit home and pray for a fried chicken to fly into your mouth. That would be tempting God. And that, was, that set the pace and the tone for the reformers and how they viewed labor. John Calvin would write 20 years later on his essay, How We Are to Use This Present Life. Calvin wrote, Our work, listen to these words, Our work is the principal part of our lives and the part that means the most to God, laboring six days. The Puritans were well known for their practice of regularly preaching on the subject of the doctrine of vocation. A great example of this is William Perkins' famous treatise called The Treatise of the Vocations or the Callings of Men. And Perkins would regularly, if he hadn't preached on vocation and work in about six months, he would apologize to his congregation. And he did several series through his, his ministry on this issue of vocation. And when asked why, the first thing he said, as I said a moment ago, is because so much of our time is spent in labor. It's quantitatively important. Remember, you will spend, if you're a normal person, you'll spend 2,000 hours this year in work. You'll spend 100,000 hours in your life on work. It's important. It's, it's vital. And then one of the reasons why Perkins would preach on this every year is what he called covenantal reasons for the sake of the portion of the congregation who were under 18. And Perkins would say instruction for our children in these matters is vital. Training our children to work, giving them a work ethic, is one of the most important parental tasks we have. Now, I will tell you, just in the last few weeks, I've spoken to two small business owners who need to hire people. And I've said, I, I think I may know some young people who need a job. And these two men, completely apart from one another, said to me, was well, the person you're thinking of know how to work eight hours in a row? Do they have a work ethic? Parents, let me ask you, have you trained your child to work all day? They are not prepared to leave your house unless they know how to work eight hours in a row, and probably more, and maybe work up a sweat. So how do you labor in a vocation? We're thinking about the creation ordinance of work. Because it's not just God's plan that you work, but that you labor in a calling. What is a calling? It comes from the Latin word vocari. And Perkins, writing about this, says it's a, a kind of work ordained and placed on man by God for the common good. John Cotton, uh, one of the early American Puritans, said, As soon as God draws a man to himself, that man won't rest until he finds a lawful calling where he may serve God and man. Let's rehearse how you should labor in a vocation. I'm speaking especially to young adults who are struggling with what to do. And to parents who are raising children and need some simple wisdom to pass on to them. First of all, parents, you should train your children to look for a calling that is a lawful vocation. Now, there are all kinds of vocations that aren't lawful for the Christians. Now, the, the, I could do this, you know, in an extravagant way and said, for example, when we lived in Nevada, prostitution is legal in Nevada. Well, that's not a lawful vocation. Uh, but there are other things that parents... Think about what you're doing to your child. If, if you make a big deal about the NFL or NASCAR, the problem is those aren't lawful vocations because they are done on the Lord's Day. And so, parents, you, have, you need to 
turn your gaze away from those things in terms of saying, well, when you grow up, you want to be the, the quarterback for the Cowboys or you want to be the next Dale Earnhardt Jr. or whoever. Those aren't lawful vocations, not to be aspired to. Second, and now let's get to some of the more important issues, is parents, you want to train your children to pursue a calling where they may serve others and serve the common good. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10, 24, let no one seek his own good but that of his neighbor. Or Philippians 2, 4, where Paul tells us to look out for the interest of others is more important than ourselves. We're typically selfish when determining our calling. What can I get out of my job? Or what do I enjoy the most? Instead of saying, no, I'm going to choose the work not that gratifies my pride the most or enriches me the most, but one where I'm most serviceable to my fellow man. Richard Baxter said, writing in the late 1500s, some callings are lawful, but they do so little good for our fellow man. And he uses the examples. Let's see if any of you thought of pursuing these vocations. Wig makers and lace sellers. He says, these are, they're lawful. But they do so little good for your fellow men that a Christian man should say, how can I do more good to my neighbor? The ministers of Boston in 1699 passed a resolution, according to Cotton Mather's History of Early America, that no occupation be deemed lawful except those that could be absolutely proven to be good for public society. So stop and ask yourself right now. Is your vocation something that brings benefit to your fellow man? When we were in Las Vegas, we had several people when we got there who worked in casinos. And we had a few people who were blackjack dealers. And I started teaching on vocation, and I brought up this point. And, of course, I knew what would happen as I stood at the back door. I was converged upon in about 10 seconds after I was done. And it was my blackjack dealers. And they said, Carl, do you think being a blackjack dealer is a lawful vocation? I said, no. Because I said, do you think turning over pieces of cardboard so you can deprive people of their money is a lawful vocation? Help them all get jobs elsewhere. Because I said, you're not doing good to your fellow man. Well, please allow me to beat this dead horse to death. Why should you be laboring in a vocation that does good to others? Well, because the second greatest commandment, loving others, requires it. Because the covenant mandates it. We are to be a blessing, according to Genesis 12, to the nations. So another answer of how to labor in a vocation is in a fitting vocation. Has God given you suitable gifts for the calling you desire? We're told in Romans 12.3 that we ought to be sober-minded and honest in our estimation of our gifts. Parents, you must heed this. You have to give your children honest ideas about their gifts. Spurgeon would do this when he was judging men for the, the ministry. He had set up a, a training college called the Pastor's College at Metropolitan Tabernacle in the 1870s, and he paid for all the men who would study there. So nobody paid tuition, nobody bought books, but he was the one-man entrance committee. And when men applied to the pastor's college, he would ask them one question. He would say, tell me the last ten books you read and how they shaped your thinking. And Spurgeon was ascertaining two important facts. One was this man a reader. If God's calling a man to ministry, that man has a thirst for knowledge and truth, he'll be a reader. And then he was ascertaining, was this man articulate? Could this man think on his feet and answer a question without rambling or being tongue-tied? Does he have immediate people skills and rapport building? When you think of that, he was judging by that, is this man a fit for the vocation? Think in Scripture of men who are in a, in a fitting vocation. Joseph, the administrator, when you trace his career through his time in Potiphar's house in Genesis 39, even his time in jail, he ends up being the administrator of the jail, and then he's the administrator of the nation. He fit as an administrator. And so William Perkins said to parents, parents, do not let your children pursue any calling without the wise approbation of godly people in that calling. So, for example, practically, talk to a godly accountant before you pursue that. Talk to a, a godly plumber before you pursue that vocation as a believing plumber. Well, 
as well. Think about a fitting vocation. Uh, think, does, does this actually fit with God's providential circumstances? We pastored a young lady in Oklahoma City who wanted to be a marine biologist. And she's a fascinating young lady. And so I said, well, tell me about that. Uh, why do you want to be a marine biologist? I said, if you, do you go to the ocean a lot? Never been to the ocean. Can you swim? No, I can't swim. How are your grades in science? I made a D minus last semester. And I said, why marine biology? She said, I saw a movie about it. And so that's why I want to do that. Needless to say, I had to break the news to her. I didn't think that she fit in that vocation. Well, in terms of asking you some specific questions about your vocation and about your labor, do you labor in the name of Christ? Can you do your work and it bring honor to Christ? Do you do your work heartily, as Colossians 3.23 says? Would Jesus, if he came to your work, say, well done, good and faithful service, or would he find you stretching out coffee bricks? Do you labor for the boss or for the master? Do you have the practice of seeing every piece of work you do must be good enough to pass God's inspection? Or do you say, ah, it's good enough for government work? Another assertion, application to you. No matter what you're calling, one of the things I see over and over again is covetousness in callings. I see men who say, man, I, I wish I could do that. Remember what we're told in Philippians 4.11. No matter the circumstance, to be content. And so are you content in your calling? Another issue. Do you understand that your vocation is a divine calling? I, I'm very thankful that we as Presbyterians require that ministers demonstrate they have the internal call and the external call to be a minister. I think that's great. What I wish is that we would be consistent as people of the Reformation and say, we demand that our engineers have a sense of divine calling. We demand that our plumbers have a sense of divine calling. That calling is not just for ministers. It's for all believers. That was something that the Protestants reclaimed. And so I would ask you, do you view your vocation as a divine calling? If so, this will take you through difficult times and menial tasks if you recognize that what you do is a calling. Another application I'd make to you is purpose to be excellent, uh, a master at your vocation. Sandy's grandfather was Pete Nickel, huge hulk of a Ukrainian, Polish, German immigrant. And in his community, Pete Nickel in western Oklahoma was known as the best grave digger in the county. And when you died, you wanted Pete Nickel to dig your grave because it was said he could do a six by six like nobody else. And he did it in hard red clay, and he did it with a pick and a shovel by himself. And he was known when Pete Nickel died, it was well, who's going to dig our graves now? And so I would ask you, have you purposed to be, no matter what it is, if you're a landscaping guy or, a, or a, an attorney, have you purposed to be excellent and a master at your vocation? Have you purposed each day when you get up and go to work to do nothing slightly or half-heartedly? And then I would speak to parents about this issue. Parents, don't rely on guidance counselors or aptitude tests. Don't leave it to chance. There is no such thing. Guide your children. You know your children's strengths and weaknesses and gifts better than anyone, and so point them to a place of service to others. And I would say finally, there is a reward for good stewards of their calling and a chastisement for unrighteous stewards of callings. If you belong to Christ, if you've seen that you're a sinner in need of grace, if you've repented of sin and turned to Christ in faith, if he's delivered you from the domain of darkness, then in gratitude for free grace received, serve him, not just in the church, but day by day in your calling. Work for Christ's glory as unto the Lord. Work where Christ places you until he calls you home. Let's pray together. Our Father, we pray for a renewed zeal and excellence 
a delight in our callings. Lord, we thank you that we have no mystery about what we are to do Monday through Saturday, but you made it clear, even from the foundation of the world, from the beginning of creation, that we are to be found in lawful labor and vocation. And so, Lord, we pray for this congregation, that we would be noteworthy for our zeal to labor and to do it for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. See you tonight at 6 p.m.